to everybody um, and good afternoon, good morning and good night, uh, depending on where you are in the world. This is very cool. Um, we're going to get started here. So uh, I hope uh, everybody sit back, relax and ready to go. Um, all right, great. So today I'm going to be talking about Rust at Microsoft, um, Rust, the programming language. For those not familiar, the cute little crab that's running around, uh, their name is Ferris. Uh, so it's the mascot uh, of Rust. Uh, everybody say hello to Ferris. Um, and Ferris will be guiding us on our journey while we talk about Rust uh, at Microsoft. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Ryan Levick. I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. Um, and during my day job, I basically do everything Rust um, at Microsoft. Um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about why Microsoft is interested in Rust, uh, why we believe uh, at Microsoft that the industry as a whole should be interested in the language, um, and a little bit about the problem that we are facing as an industry why we believe Rust uh, is a, a possible solution um, to that problem. All right, so what is this problem uh, that I'm alluding to? Well, it all starts with this simple fact. Our systems are more interconnected and performing more and more important tasks every single day. Um, and really what this translates to is that our systems are more vulnerable and attackers have even more incentive to attack those systems over time. So keep this in mind. We're, we're growing our systems together. And um, with that comes the incentive for attacking from nefarious uh, parties. So what does that look like in terms of numbers? Well, if we have a graph of, of CVEs, and for those who are not aware, CVE stands for Common Vulnerability and Exposure. Um, these are kind of security vulnerabilities is how you can think about them, severe security vulnerabilities. If we graph them over time from 2006 until 2018, this is what the graph looks like. Um, it keeps going up and up and up. Now, I mean, the lucky part of this story is that um, the reason it's going up is because we're more aggressively looking for these things ahead of time. We're writing a lot more software, um, things like that. So kind of to be expected that they would go up. Um, but I think the thing to take away from, from this graph uh, is that the problem is definitely not getting better. Um, we are introducing more security vulnerabilities over time. Um, and there might be reasons for that, um, but we are definitely seeing more of them over time. Um, and now these are Microsoft specific numbers and, you know, I didn't give exact numbers here um, because that's kind of irrelevant. Uh, but we also see no reason why a graph of at any other company would be any different than the one at Microsoft. Um, so this is really an, an industry wide problem. Okay, so how much does this actually cost uh, in, in dollar terms then? Um, well, if we look at a dollar, a dollar figure, um, one that we can come up with based on some research that we've done is $150,000. Um, and now that's per incident. Um, and by the way, this figure is from about 2004 um, and it's adjusted for inflation, but um, there's absolutely zero reason to believe that uh, this is not an extremely conservative estimate. Um, and so if you're looking at $150,000 uh, per, per incident, um, that's, that's pretty severe. And, and I should also mention that these are, these are just direct costs to Microsoft in mitigating these vulnerabilities. And so we're not taking into account things like loss of reputation to Microsoft, um, which surely costs a lot more than this. We're not talking about cost to customers who are affected by this, which is definitely much larger than this. Um, and so the dollar figure right that you see right here is, is absolutely conservative um, in its scope. And so, uh, you know, the next question becomes, okay, how many issues are we facing uh, per year? Um, and uh, one figure that we have from 2018 is uh, 468, um, which if you do some simple math on kind of like the real base cost of this, then, you know, you're upwards in the hundreds of millions um, that, that you can, uh, or, or into the tens of millions. And then if you extrapolate out from there, you're into the hundreds of millions uh, of costs when it comes to uh, cost to, to us as a company at Microsoft and cost to our customers as well. Um, but uh, really, I mean, you know, 468 is, is pretty bad. And if you do the math, you end up with a figure that's, that's you know, fairly bad, um, but I wouldn't call it catastrophic. But of course, this is kind of the low end of our estimation. The question then becomes, can the cost be 
uh, even higher? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, there's been a number of issues in the past that have, have easily cost way, way, way beyond this uh, $150,000 figure that we know of. Um, the one that's that's uh, displayed here on your screen is the WannaCry um, exploit, which was derived from, from an NSA um, uh, derived exploit. Um, it was used as a worm, as a worm to infect PCs in, in upwards of 150 different countries. Um, and the thing to remember about here was that the bug was found and patched before the public was aware uh, of WannaCry. Um, but still 200,000 computers were infected and they were infected um, because uh, uh, people did not patch their system uh, quick enough. Um, so keep that in mind. It's not uh, purely about finding things and then fixing them because people uh, oftentimes will not go ahead and patch their software afterwards. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to get a, an estimate of exactly how much this costs humanity as a whole, um, but kind of the back of the napkin math that we like to do at, at Microsoft for this type of thing um, is that it, it could have cost upwards of four billion U.S. dollars uh, for Microsoft and for uh, uh, for customers uh, uh, who are using the software. Um, and again, I want to reiterate that this is basically after the the problem had been patched. So one can only imagine what would it have uh, what it would have cost uh, if the problem had not been found in time. Um, and then specifically, if you look at some examples like uh, the uh, national healthcare system in, in the UK, the NHS, um, I believe it costs somewhere around 92 million pounds um, just for them to fix this problem in their own systems. And that's that's one uh, one country um, and one kind of uh, entity in that country dealing um, with this problem. So it's so it's quite big. Um, and really, when we're looking at this, uh, the core of this problem uh, comes down to memory safety. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, memory safety issues account for a large majority of uh, CVEs that we account in the wild. Now, what is memory safety? Um, for those who are, are C++ programmers or C programmers, you'll, you'll be familiar with this, but uh, I ask others uh, who have not done C or C++ in a while um, to, to think back when you have done it, you've probably run into issues when coding, like um, use of an uninitialized memory, use after free, double free, buffer overruns. It's basically the use of memory incorrectly. You are doing something where you should not be doing uh, you're doing something you should not be doing with memory. Um, but there are other issues that kind of fall under this umbrella of, of memory safety that aren't typically assigned to that label. Um, and uh, one of them, for instance, is data races where you have kind of, um, you, you have access uh, to, to areas of memory that are not kind of, um, th that are not reliably or predictably um, accessed in a way through things like locks or something like that. So you kind of have these races where you don't know until after it happens exactly who reads and writes and in what order. Um, and this can also lead to, to extreme uh, cases of, of memory safety. Uh, and uh, if we're looking at the, the graph of, uh, of memory safety versus not memory safety um, that we have at Microsoft, if you, the, the y-axis here is the percent of CVEs um, that we have. And uh, in orange is how many of those CVEs are memory safety related and, and the yellow is not memory safety. Uh, memory safety related. And you can see that over time, 70% uh, of CVEs at Microsoft are memory safety issues. And this is not going down. There is no real trend. It's just staying the exact same. So, um, and this is not despite massive efforts on our part to fix this issue. Um, it still seems to be uh, a common uh, a common thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about those efforts in, in the future. All right. So, um, and this is where, you know, the part that I, that I don't like to do, but at the core of this really is, uh, is C++. Um, this is not to, to bash on the language or anything like that. It's a, it's a great language that has done a lot and built a lot of great software out there. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that C++ at its core is not a safe language. Um, it, it definitely provides, uh, especially a more modern um, variants of C++ um, ways of, uh, of protecting yourself against some of these issues. Um, but uh, C++ is not a memory safe language and no one would really pretend uh, that it is. Um, and so uh, this, this is a bit concerning because um, C++ and C are used to build the very, very core of our foundation of our systems. Um, the systems that truly run the world. Um, and we're using uh, languages that um, 
uh, are because they are quite old um, and come from a different era, do not provide us uh, the ability to protect ourselves um, from uh, from these kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, and so, you know, uh, long before I ever joined Microsoft, people started looking at this uh, question and, and started asking, okay, um, how do we fix this? Um, and there's there's been a lot of great ideas, um, and I'm going to go through some of them. Um, uh, I, I want to reiterate that these ideas are, are not necessarily uh, bad ideas, they're just not holistic uh, solutions. Um, and so it's not that I'm saying that we shouldn't do uh, some of this stuff, it's that uh, it's not enough. Um, and the first one of these is a, a kind of a Hacker News's favorite um, mantra uh, when, when these things come up is we need better programmers, uh, which I am absolutely for training people. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing to do. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is there is zero evidence um, that doing holistic training uh, of C and C++ developers will actually fix this issue in any significant way. Um, and, and you should better believe that we are doing a lot of uh, training at Microsoft um, to make sure that people do not introduce these kinds of bugs. And as you saw before, 70% uh, um, are still introduced uh, year over year. So um, this is not really um, a, a way that we can fix it. And, and one other thing I want to add too is, um, you know, a lot of people find uh, sometimes are personally attacked when when this is suggested. Well, you know, I'm a good programmer. Why can't you just be a good programmer too? Um, and you know, besides the problems I have with that kind of uh, sentiment in the first place, um, we're not even really talking about uh, individual programmers here. It's very possible to for two components. Um, written in, in a memory unsafe language um, that in isolation work perfectly fine. And when they're composed together, they don't compose properly because they make different assumptions about how, how memory should be treated. Um, and so this isn't really about individual programmers, but rather uh, about kind of this uh, at scale. So another idea that we have is uh, we need to um, use better uh, static analysis tools. Um, and this is a great idea. Uh, static analysis can get you pretty far, um, but there's a lot of problems with it. Um, first of all, static analysis is not on by default. It requires that you make sure that it's included in the build system, that it's run on every pull request. Um, it slows things down, and so there's a lot of incentive not to run static analysis. And so there's a lot of kind of overhead of process that needs to be put in place um, to get this uh, up and running. Um, and uh, by all means, uh, more of this should happen. Um, it really does help with the issue. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, if it's not on by default, uh, it won't it won't help um, in a large amount of cases. And static analysis is limited. Um, when you're working with a with a memory unsafe language, um, uh, you know it doesn't have all the annotations that it needs for a static analysis tool to be able to figure out if something that is happening is correct or not. Um, and so really you need something kind of built in uh, to the language to make sure that everything is caught. Um, and so uh, really with this, um, the, the last idea and the only idea that we think that will work is that we need to make these issues impossible to introduce. Um, this is the only thing that can possibly help happen is if uh, programmers just do not have the ability to introduce these issues in the very first place. And at the end of the day, what it comes down to is uh, the cost of a bug at compile time is orders of magnitude less costly than one in production. Um, and I, I feel like I should do orders of orders of magnitude because it truly is uh, the case. We want to catch things early on because as soon as they get out into the wild, um, as we saw with, with WannaCry, um, it doesn't matter how quickly you find it and patch it, um, it things will still go wrong uh, in, in reality. Okay, so so how do we do this? Well, one thing that we can do is, is runtime checking. Um, and this is great. Uh, the problem with this in some memory unsafe languages is that it, again, requires discipline. So you need the programmer to... Um, to know when to use these constructs and make sure that they use them at all times. And sometimes it's impossible, uh, or at the very least extremely hard, to know when uh, runtime checking uh, constructs are used and when they're not, and, and which ones should be used when. Um, and so you're, you're back to static analysis with its uh, imperfections. And so again, runtime checks have their place, um, but they also in, you know, introduce um, runtime overhead that might not be appropriate uh, for, for uh, specific use cases. Okay, um, next we have garbage collection. 
which again is is also wonderful. And um, I, I definitely think that people should uh, look into garbage collection if it works for your use case. Um, and this doesn't just mean kind of, you know, Java style or C sharp style uh, uh, tracing garbage collection, but also things like uh, um, reference counting and, and the sort uh, are definitely useful. Um, so if you can use something like C sharp, then by all means, go ahead and do it. Um, but uh, what we're talking about here uh, is system software. So we're talking about the software at the very, the very base of what we're writing, um, where really we only have a kind of assembly um, below it uh, to really kind of get closer to the machine. Um, and so uh, things like garbage collection are oftentimes not acceptable uh, and runtime checks are not acceptable. Um, and so with this in mind, keep in mind when we're talking about this, we're really talking about system software. So basically anything where a garbage collector is not acceptable. So if your line starts going back to garbage collection, you can just forget about it because by definition, um, we're talking about non-garbage collected systems. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, the Microsoft Security Response Center, which I will refer to as MSRC, um, they're the team that's in charge of, uh, of these kinds of security related issues uh, inside of Microsoft, um, decided to form the Safe Systems Programming Languages uh, Initiative, which is an initiative to try and address this issue by, um, by making our systems programming languages safer. And so the first prong of that is making C++ safer when we can. Um, but we know that that is kind of has limited returns and we're kind of reaching the wall um, when it comes to that. Um, the second is uh, developing new uh, programming languages or programming constructs that allow us to do systems level programming um, in a safe way. Um, and recently, uh, the Verona project, which is from MSR, Microsoft Research, uh, was just released as a very, very early version um, as a possible kind of as a research project for and how you can um, do systems level programming in a, in a safe way. Um, but the third prong is kind of the one that we're most keen on right now. Um, and that is adopting the, the industry's best chance uh, for addressing this issue head on. And we believe that to be Rust. Um, and so, by the way, for those that don't know, this is, uh, this is Ferris. Um, and Ferris will be telling us a, a little bit about uh, what Rust offers us. So the first thing um, is performance. We need performance. Um, and when it comes to performance, the way you can think about Rust is that it is on par with C and C++. Um, in the, in the uh, components that we've already started doing some rewrites on or, or development in, um, we see uh, performance on par with C++. And um, if, if we had to pick, is it faster or slower? It's very hard to say um, because we, you know, it requires a kind of large scale study, um, but uh, it seems to lean towards faster. We have a couple of components um, that uh, because uh, um, of certain very technical issues, they, they came out to be slightly faster than the C++ uh, component was. Now, of course, the C++ component could have been rewritten to be probably just as fast. So it's, it's not necessarily important whether it's Rust and C++, how they, how they um, differ in performance characteristics. It comes down to the fact that they're similar and should be thought of in similar terms. Um, and the next point is, is correctness. So um, this is a very hand wavy thing, but it's something that kind of, if you've programmed in Rust before, ha have, have seen. Um, typically, you end up debugging Rust programs uh, at runtime less often because it has a lot of those compile time constructs that allow for um, correct programs, programs that just don't have bugs in them. And of course, it's very possible to write bugs in, in Rust. I, would, I, I don't want to act otherwise, um, but, uh, but Rust definitely excels in uh, in creating uh, programs that tend to run correctly um, when when they compile. Um, and, and features that allow that are things like it doesn't have uh, nulls, um, so that's all checked for you. Um, it allows you to um, encapsulate unsafe APIs in safe APIs so that even if you have to do um, nasty bits, um, you, you don't have to worry too much um, about uh, um, you know, things going wrong, you can, you can encapsulate it in a safe API that others will be able to use correctly all the, um, and things like, uh, Rust doesn't have exceptions. Uh, so, um, if something can fail, you kind of know from its, uh, from its, um, function signature, whether it can fail and you're kind of forced towards handling that, or at least acknowledging the fact that it can happen, um, which can help you build more robust systems. 
Um, and lastly, uh, you know, I think productivity is important to point out. Rust does have a steep learning curve, um, and so you won't be productive uh, at the beginning. Um, but once you get over that learning curve, it definitely pays off in dividends, and we're seeing that um, across the board. Now, it's hard to quantify that, um, but I think it's it's uh, without controversy to say that you'll uh, once you get up to speed, um, a seasoned C++ developer can be just as productive in Rust. And, and it seems like they can be more productive because of this kind of more correct um, uh, property that we talked about before. Of, but, you know, it's hard to, to prove these things. So we um, were hesitant to kind of claim that outright. Um, and, and, and again, Rust also has uh, things like uh, modern tooling, like a package manager and, and built-in test framework and things like that, that um, kind of uh, people outside of the system space have come accustomed to. Um, well, it turns out systems programmers can have nice things too. And, and this really shows um, when uh, Stack Overflow comes out with a survey every year um, of the most loved uh, programming languages and Rust has been number one for the past four years. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like the trend is ending. Um, I don't know how to, to go beyond that other than I feel the same way as well. Um, and so um, I think the thing to take away from this is that it's it's definitely not a pain to adopt Rust as a from a programmer's perspective. Um, people tend to enjoy it. Um, but but this is all well and good, and this is definitely a, a, a reasons for you as a as a programmer to go out and check out Rust um, because you want to to get into it and and you might be interested in it. But um, kind of as an organization as large as Microsoft, um, all of this is a little bit too fuzzy and a little bit too flowery, um, and we we need some kind of uh, better justification for adopting the language, and that comes back to uh, safety. Um, that Rust is a completely memory safe language by default without garbage collection um, with minimal runtime checking. Um, so really only where runtime checking is kind of necessary um, will you end up doing runtime checking. Um, and it's all opt-in and very obvious where you're doing that. Um, and it's free of things like data races, which, uh, you know, this uh, is not really a, a feature of any language that I know of maybe outside of Elixir or Erlang that is adopted in an industry that has this property um, where you are definitely forced to, to deal uh, with thread safety um, and, and unthread safe uh, programs just don't, don't compile. Um, and uh, you have, uh, I think the most important thing here is the ability to, to wrap unsafe usage. So Rust does have an unsafe keyword that allows you to do the nasty things that you might have to do as a systems programmer. Um, you know, if you're writing a, a device driver, um, Rust doesn't know that, that uh, writing to memory address 0x1734ab uh, is the right place to write to, um, but you can encapsulate that in a safe API, um, and then people who are using your code um, don't have to worry about that nastiness. Um, they can use it without fear, um, and if they use it incorrectly, the code simply won't compile. And this is really what we talk about when we think of Rust's 10x improvement. The thing that makes it worth um, investing in is that it is, uh, it seems to be um, at least 10 times better than what we currently have. And that's kind of the threshold um, that we've seen. Jer Jeremy Fitzhardinger from, uh, from Facebook talked about this in his talk at RustConf last year, how at Facebook, they, they also see um, this as, as Rust's 10x improvement that allows uh, justifies that investment and and what we mean by that is if you take a c or c plus plus code base um, and you ask yourself how much of that code base do we need to security audit for memory safety issues specifically and the answer of course is 100 percent you have to look at every single line of the c plus plus code to know whether you're doing something uh, funny or not um, and something that you shouldn't do when it comes to memory safety and, and with rust um, the answer is much smaller um, and, uh, you know, it's hard, we don't have exact figures right now for our, the software that we write. Um, but just looking out at, at what's currently been written in the Rust ecosystem, um, it seems to be that for kind of, uh, fundamental, fundamental Rust packages that exist today, um, around 1% of the code is unsafe. So that means you have to look at that 1% of the code. Um, and as long as it's doing the right thing, which you can tell locally, um, then you can be uh, sure that the rest of that code, that 99%, uh, is completely free of memory safety issues, which is which is really great. And so the issue that we really say is for security critical software, C++ is no longer uh, acceptable in this regard. Um, and uh, the bet then is Rust allows us to write performance security critical components safely. Um, but, you know, 
at the end of the day, uh, this is all well and good, but the real challenge here uh, is integrating Rust instead of rewriting the entire world. We have a lot of C++ at Microsoft. We have a lot of C and C++ in the world. Um, and that code is not going anywhere. And in fact, in, in Microsoft, C++ continues to be written and will continue to be written for, for a while to come, um, if not forever. Uh, and, uh, and the real challenge then is to see if we can get Rust integrated into that world so that we can make sure uh, that, um, that uh, you know, we benefit from Rust without having to just do everything all at once and rewrite the entire world. So let's look at, uh, at a few of those uh, challenges specifically. Um, uh, the first one that we have here is uh, existing tooling and, and specifically assumptions are, uh, that we have around MSVC. So Rust runs on LLVM. Um, we are almost exclusively an MSVC shop at, at Microsoft, although that has changed a little bit with, uh, with the new Edge uh, browser. Um, and, uh, you know, we have some tooling that, that assumes uh, MSVC uh, binaries. And when you build um, with LLVM, you get something different. Now, Rust uses uh, the, the same linker, the MSVC linker, and so that helps a bunch. Um, but uh, there's definitely some challenges there. Um, beyond that, uh, build systems. Cargo is Rust's uh, built-in build system. Um, cargo playing around, around with existing build systems can definitely be a challenge. Um, and Cargo is wonderful um, for kind of pure Rust projects or, or Rust projects with that one occasional C dependency. But when Rust is the new person in town um, and Rust needs to play along with uh, with vast amount of, uh, of existing C++ code, um, things can get challenging. And so um, we're, we're figuring out ways to get around this. Um, another one is, is interrupt. So we have, a, a, as we said, a ton of existing C++ code. Um, you know, we have things in the Rust community like BindGen, which allow you to kind of, it, it's a tool that reads Rust code and produces um, C and C++ headers. And C BindGen is the other way, where it reads C++ headers and can generate uh, uh, um, Rust code. And so this works well for simple APIs, for uh, particularly for C APIs, but we have a lot of rich C++ code. Um, so how can we interact with Rust that doesn't have this kind of native C++ interop? And so we're looking at things like uh, interrupting using COM um, or WinRT that are these kind of ABI, um, custom ABI uh, interop layers that already exist and are widely used at Microsoft and um, making sure that we can use them from, from Rust code as well. And then there's some some kind of weird stuff. Um, we have to have a trusted tool chain. Um, uh, Rust was originally built with OCaml. It's now built in itself. Um, how, do we go back and build an OCaml compiler and then you know compile all the Rust compilers all the way up till till today? We'd be doing that for a very long time. So we have to build a trusted tool chain. Um, luckily, there's a project out there for compile uh, com a Rust compiler written in C++ that does very minimal stuff. It's not complete, but it's enough to to build the, the compiler itself. Um, and then we can use that C++ generated Rust compiler to kind of get us up to the latest version, which is uh, very interesting. Um, we have binary security policies that need to be followed, uh, followed and compliance is just its own thing. Um, and then, you know, Humans, I think this is the last and the greatest uh, uh, challenge that we have with Rust is convincing others. Um, we have a lot of people who have dedicated a long time to C++ and um, you know, naturally there is resistance to adopting new things. Um, can we convince them to give this a try? And, and, and most of all, can we train them to do the right thing? Um, we typically see excitement, but we know that as we scale this out more and more that um, that excitement will wane. And there will be some people that just want to get their job done in the language that they already know. Um, and so this will definitely be definitely be a challenge going forward. Um, a little bit about uh, Rust's use in industry. Um, of course, Microsoft, we are starting to use it. Facebook uh, seems to be adopting um, it quite a bit. Um, uh, Amazon has, has said that they are using it. Well, we, we know for a fact that they're using it for, um, for Lambda. Uh, the uh, the runtime that runs Amazon Lambda is written in Rust, and they have also said that um, stuff inside of EC2 and things like that is written in Rust as well. So we're seeing that there. Google has adopted it. Dropbox has rewritten their sync file sync engine in it. Um, Intel and ARM are both uh, investigating. Um, Cloudflare is a is a huge uh, user in the kind of a smaller cloud uh, based company. Mozilla, the original creator of Rust, is still using it quite a bit, and 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 uh, also 
the likes of, of companies like Discord as well using it. So there's uh, there is adoption um, of Rust happening, and uh, we definitely hope to be uh, at the forefront of that. Um, and so a little bit real quick about resources if you're if you're interested in learning the language, um, because I, I assume a lot of us out there are devs and we just want to get our hands in some code. Um, enough with uh, you know the management talk here. Um, these are some great uh, resources. Um, the book is, is fantastic. Uh, Steve Klapnick was uh, speaking today at this conference. He is the co-author of this book. Um, I definitely recommend starting with the book. Uh, it's a it's a really great resource for learning language. And then next you have Rust by example, which takes you through example Rust code um, to, to get to know it better. And uh, Rust slings is a kind of interactive um, command line interface for, for learning Rust, which is really great. And there's a bunch of others, so just go ahead and, and search out there. Um, there's more books and, and tutorials. Um, give it a try and see what you see if you like it. And um, we, I think we as an industry in general need to um, be very, uh, you're very aware of this language and, and give it uh, an honest shot because um, we have a problem that uh, we have not been able to fix uh, for a very long time. And uh, Rust might be the way that we go ahead and fix that. Um, and with that, I'm going to end it here um, with any uh, questions. Um, uh, let me know if you have anything, anything you want to talk about, anything uh, that might be of interest uh, to you. Mm. Um, we, I saw one uh, question here. Do garbage collected languages experience more or less memory CVEs uh, than Rust? Um, that's a very hard question to answer. Um, I'll tell you my gut uh, opinion and take it with a big old grain of salt. Um, I would imagine that there will be more memory CVEs in Rust than in garbage collected languages because of the nature of work that Rust is, uh, is meant to do. Um, in garbage collected languages, you typically don't have to do very low level programming uh, where you are writing to arbitrary places in memory, um, where you are potentially doing inline assembly, um, uh, where you don't have an operating system to do anything for you. You are the operating system. Um, most uh, times you use a garbage collected language, you can rely on that infrastructure being there. Um, and, and oftentimes with Rust, you don't have that. So you might have to end up writing unsafe code um, and with that unsafe code, um, I, I don't want to say all bets are off uh, because you know unsafe Rust is a um, a superset of safe Rust, so you still have all the protection there, but it allows you to do things um, that are not safe. Uh, that you, I should say, that you should verify. You need to verify um, are safe, um, and we all know humans will make mistakes, so there will be CVEs uh, written in Rust. Um, now, if the question is. Uh, is there the same amount of uh, CVEs and safe Rust and garbage collected languages, so just the safe uh, subset of Rust, then I would say probably they're uh, about equal. Uh, it's hovering around zero. Um, so. so with Microsoft investing in developing the Rust-inspired language for Rona, is MS still interested in adopting the Rust um, so, uh, Verona is a research project. Um, it's, uh, very interesting, um, where, where Verona will ultimately end up is a, is a big a question that I'm, first of all, I'm not qualified to answer because I'm not working on it, but second of all, I, uh, I hope I'm not overstepping my boundaries when I say we have no idea what Verona will turn into. Um, one possibility is that it goes nowhere. Another possibility is that the ideas that are taken from it um, are uh, adopted into Rust itself. And the third possibility is that it becomes a language in its own outright. I don't believe that uh, Verona will fill every single niche that Rust fills. And so even if that third possibility turns into reality, um, I think that Rust and Verona would exist next to each other. Um, but that's a big if, so uh, it's way too early to tell that. Um, and uh, if you're interested in these things, uh, head over to GitHub and uh, and check it out there and, and see what you think. Um, this may be a session in itself, but can you speak to the language features that make it inherently safe while still performant? That is 100% uh, a session in its own. I'll try to do it. I, I Maybe I could have prepared some code to show you. Um, Rust has a, uh, a system built into its compiler called the, the borrow checker. Um, 
that checks ownership of values. And so statically, it knows who owns a value, who owns the memory of a, of a, a particular value, and it knows when to destroy it. Um, and so this is kind of related to um, you know, uh, RAII from C++. Um, you, you, uh, it knows when to, to destroy that value. Um, beyond that, um, it also knows if you borrow a, a particular value, um, like take a pointer to it, for instance, it knows how long that borrow lasts for and can statically check that um, you do not drop the value, don't destroy the value while you still have borrows out. Um, and uh, the, the, beyond that, um, it also enforces the reader writer par uh, paradigm where there can be multiple readers of values through pointers. So you can have multiple immutable uh, references to things um, uh, or um, and this is an exclusive or, or uh, mutable borrows to a specific value. Um, and this has a whole bunch of emergent properties um, that allow um, purely at runtime to be verify things like that uh, pointers are always valid in pointing to valid memory, um, that you are, are not mutating something that you have a constant pointer to, um, that you are not uh, mutating something on one thread while you're reading it on another, um, a whole bunch of things. And it all comes from this system of, of borrow checking, and that all happens in the compiler at compile time um, and falls away uh, during runtime. Um, I think that's as best as I can do uh, just talking here today, um, but give the book a read, um, and I think you'll you'll definitely come out of it with a better impression um, of of how Rust accomplishes some of these things. Um, next question I see here is Rust common enough that we're starting to see smaller open source projects adopt it, or is it still seen as an obscure enough language that it will discourage contributions? Um, that's a tough question to answer um, because I think. Um, how can I answer this? I personally, and again, salt being thrown around here, grains of it, uh, I personally have not seen people discouraged from contributing to a project because it's written in Rust. Uh, but I have seen people drawn to a project because it is written in Rust. I am sure that there are people who come to a project and see it written in this language and go, I have no interest. Um, but that's probably true of every language. Um, I don't particularly want to contribute uh, to a project in um, uh, Pascal, nothing against Pascal, um, um, or uh, let's let's take a more um, uh, modern language, or at least a language that's used quite a bit, uh, Java. I, sorry, I don't, I don't want to get into language bashing here. Uh, Java is great. It's just not for me. Uh, I wouldn't contribute to a project in Java. Is that Java's fault? Is it, you know, does that mean Java is less valuable? No, there are plenty of people who would contribute to it. So it's kind of hard uh, to know these things. Um, Rust has a, an, an adoption level that I think it can, it, it's definitely not an esoteric language. Um, uh, there is uh, data, both public and uh, not public, that would suggest that it is by, it's by no means a super widely adopted language like JavaScript. Um, but that it is uh, a adopted language um, in the same realm uh, as uh, as as a Go or uh, Swift or um, or Kotlin, kind of these new and upcoming uh, languages that um, don't have a huge broad industry adoption like Java or C Sharp um, does, but are still um, definitely definitely used uh, for sure. Um, so hard to tell, but um, I, I I can't say that I, I believe that Rust is is still considered an esoteric language uh, by by any means. Um, saying if I missed any questions, if you had any additional questions and I haven't gotten to them yet, please uh, pop them down in the bottom of chat. Um, we have about five more minutes, and I'm happy to to keep uh, talking um, about Rust. Um, or if anybody wants to know um, how to learn the, the language more, what um, what are some uh, good uh, use cases for the for the language as well? Where where does Rust excel and where it doesn't excel? I'm happy to to talk to that as well. Um, 
I will mention, uh, for instance, we already talked about Steve Klapnick giving a talk today on WebAssembly. WebAssembly is definitely a, a very new technology um, that where a lot of development is happening in Rust. Um, and so as far as new kind of up and coming technologies um, where Rust is dominant, uh, that, that would definitely be a big one. Um, and we have a project uh, at Microsoft right now that I've helped out with uh, for running WebAssembly workloads in Kubernetes, um, where we chose to write that uh, in, in Rust instead of Go um, for the reasons that one, um, WebAssembly is, is a Rust dominated field currently. And so, you know, there was a lot of tooling that would have uh, been um, easier to adopt in, in Rust. And two, we just wanted to know what uh, Kubernetes tooling written in another language uh, like Rust uh, would be like. And it turns out it was really nice. Um, uh, we, there was a blog post recently posted uh, from one of the engineers there talking about why, uh, why Rust was adopted and, and kind of general feelings about it. And overall, they were quite positive. Um, so uh, is Rust being used in any released Microsoft products as of now, and which if it is not secret? So as far as um, publicly known uh, projects where Rust is being used, um, Azure IoT is the IoT solution that we have um, where Rust is being used on device um, and uh, also in the back end um, as well. Um, some of that code is, is open source, so th there's no secret there. Um, I would say a large majority of Rust code that is going to be developed in the next year or has started to be developed now is just behind the scenes stuff that we hope you never have to care about, um, other than that it's more secure because we wrote it in a secure language. Um, but uh, there are a few other small things where Rust is being used. One is the project, the Kubernetes project I just mentioned. Um, another one is uh, VS Code has some uh, small, I think the installer is written in Rust. Um, the regular expression um, program that they use is written in Rust um, for doing search and things like that. Uh, so, so there's not a ton publicly known right now, um, but I, I, did, I expect that to change some, but I think a lot of the software that we will write in Rust will be kind of private, um, uh, you know, behind the scenes magic going forward. Um, question of how does Rust compare with Golang in terms of its features and target audience? Um, so I think the biggest thing to mention is that Go has a garbage collector. Um, and so uh, I think um, if you have a uh, some kind of workload that cannot uh, stand a garbage collector, then Go is out of the question. Um, and then Rust might be um, the tool that you're looking for. I think that's kind of the biggest one. Um, all, all the other comparisons uh, of Rust and Go are, are a little bit more... Mm, up for opinion and kind of what what you how you think about uh, engineer, software engineering. Um, uh, Go has a, a, a richer standard library than Rust does. Um, Rust uh, ended up adopting a less rich standard library um, so that uh, third party uh, people could experiment with things. So for instance, Rust does not have an HTTP implementation in its standard library. You have to take in a third party dependency for that, which you know, is quite easy to do, but um, but it's not built in. Um, and there, there's a choice that you have to make there. With Go, you don't have that. Um, Go compiles faster than, than Rust does, um, but but Go has uh, has a less rich programming experience. Um, it doesn't have generics. It's uh, um, It doesn't have that strong of a type system or, or that rich of a type system, I should say. Um, those are places where, where Rust really shines, um, but Go is easier to learn. So there, there are trade-offs there. And I think, um, uh, I, you know, I only feel comfortable really saying if you need a garbage collector, uh, if you can't use a garbage collector, use Rust. And otherwise, you know, I don't know, pick one. Uh, um, I think the target audience uh, for kind of people who are creating quick uh, microservices or something, I think is still something where Go definitely beats Rust um, at the current time. I don't know if that will always be true though. So we'll see. Um, any more questions that we can end out the day with? Doesn't look like. So we're at the end of the session. I want to thank everybody for, for their attention. It was really great. Um, please reach out to me uh, online. I think the best place to reach me is twitter.com slash Ryan underscore Levick. Uh, my first and last name with an underscore between them on Twitter. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I'll be sticking around a little bit longer uh, inside of the chat for, for anybody who's curious. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the uh, conference today. So have a, have a good rest of your day.